If you haven't seen the previous video in this series, follow the link on your screen or click the link in the description or pinned comment below. Everybody's lined up at the box office for the sneak preview of Stab, but they all have those special sneak preview tickets, so why the f*** are they standing in line at the box office? They have an usher standing outside the box office, so why can't she just take the tickets? That can't be a real question. The box office has infrastructure that can deal with the amount of ticket stubs that need to be collected, genius. Imagine having to collect several hundred ticket stubs by hand. That's what you're saying here. This is 1997, 10 years before the first iPhone. Meaning, of course, that everyone here has physical tickets and not the digital ones on phones that need to be scanned. It's a dumbass white movie about some dumbass white girls. <laughs> That's racist. Mm, it's also kind of true, though. Generally speaking, horror movies involving white people are different than the ones involving black people, as black people tend to not go investigating that dark corridor that clearly has a monster in it. Again, this movie serves as a metaphor for slasher films and how we consume entertainment. The people in these films make stupid decisions all the time, because if they didn't, there would be no film. When they say... They don't transgress. They can't be punished. What they're actually saying is, if people don't make dumb decisions, there wouldn't be a movie. We view this as stupidity that allows the bad stuff to happen on screen. It's literally the reason the movie Get Out has its name. We tend to yell at the white people on the screen. Get out. Get it? And they have another usher taking the tickets that you get when you exchange the sneak preview tickets to the box office. Who the f runs this theater? Probably 75% of the movie theater managers I worked with. Is it a sin if it reflects reality? In almost every theater I've ever gone to, there is the box office where you purchase a ticket and then someone inside collects the purchase tickets. Is that just a California thing? I highly doubt that. Only in a Hollywood version of a film sneak preview would there be this kind of chaos. Plus, this is a movie within a movie based on a real-life event where real people were murdered, so this theater crowd is a bigger bag of dicks than a bag of dicks. There is an entire industry based on movies that are retellings of actual horrific events. Psycho, Silence of the Lambs, and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre are all in part based on the murders committed by Ed Gein. I'm just saying, by watching and celebrating these movies, we're all dicks, according to your logic. Also, with the real-life event aspect in mind, did the studio really find it appropriate to give away costumes based on the Ghostface Killer and the fake knives? If you went to a premiere of a movie about John Wayne Gacy, I don't think they'd be handing out clown makeup, having clowns float above you during the movie. You are forgetting that the Scream series is a satire. I know, with all the bull jive arguments your subscribers come up with to defend you guys, you have absolutely no idea what satire is. But Scream's point here is that Hollywood commodifies the tragedies of other people. They don't care, as long as asses are in seats. Now why she gotta be naked? Maybe this movie is merely suggesting there's nudity on screen? But the way this was shot in frame, the nudity is a lie. Implied nudity is still nudity. Besides, we can't see what they see. They almost certainly showed her ass. I mean, this is Heather Graham. She is nude in practically every movie she appears in. In Boogie Nights, the drapes curtain question was definitively answered. While I admire the spirit of this totally out of control sneak preview crowd, there is no f***ing way these people would be wearing their masks while watching the movie. These assholes can't see a goddamn thing. I've actually been to theaters where people have done just that, so you're wrong about reality. But this is a movie universe where, again, I remind you that they are criticizing Hollywood's commodification of these kinds of stories. You're missing the point, my guy. Hello? Hello? How were they able to get the actual ghost face voice? Did the police ever record phone calls in the first movie? There clearly was an investigation done on the Billy and Stu murders. That investigation would have yielded results that are easy for a Hollywood studio to find. So the voice modulator they found would be easy enough to procure for the set design. Hell, every single ghost face killer has found that exact voice changer, so the real sin is the company producing that shit. Look, I know that Stab is a satirical look at the original screen, but this Casey Becker heard her phone ring when she was about to take a shower and went to answer it. But in the meantime, she also had popcorn popping? This reminds me of that old camp slogan, you can't shower and pop at the same time. There were really too many slogans about showering and popping. No, I agree. What she was doing was mad dangerous. Until you take into account that she wouldn't have been in there that long because a significant amount of white people don't wash their legs when they take a shower. <laughs> You nasty. Ugh, that shit is weak. That's, that's gross. However, my main issue is that you clearly understand that Stab is a satire of Scream, but don't understand that Scream is a satire itself? Bitch, hang the phone up and star 69 his ass. Damn. So even though everyone in the theater has been making all kinds of noise since the movie started, Maureen's outburst crosses the line. That was the perfect moment for That's Racist, and you flubbed it. 
By the way, despite a total sellout of seats, and every seat is currently filled, there are still people coming in late for this movie. This is the most exaggerated movie theater scene in history until Inglorious Bastards comes along. But Jeremy, if the movie theater was at capacity, that would literally mean people would be coming in late. Have you ever been to an MCU movie opening day? The concession lines are packed and people are in line around the corner. This is not unrealistic. So Ghostface knew exactly where Phil's ear was going to be on the other side of the bathroom stall. Also, since we find out later Phil was an intended victim, then how did Ghostface know that Phil would be in the adjoining stall at this time? Or that the urinals would be taken? Ghostface could not have entered the bathroom after Phil because he's clearly already in the other stall. I have to agree. As great as the opening scene of this movie is, the killing of Phil doesn't make any logistical sense. Why was Mickey in the stall making weird sounds to even lure Phil to put his ear on the dirty bathroom stall wall anyway? Way too many things had to go right for the killer hair, and this is a true suspension of disbelief breaker. Totally get that there are a bunch of people dressed up like Ghostface that have a bunch of toy knives, but how in the hell did no one in the surrounding area see Maureen get stabbed? Even if he thought somehow a knife going into a body was fake, there would still be some sort of reaction. You mean in the theater where dozens of people are pretending to stab each other? Don't get me wrong, after the Aurora shooter, I side-eye pretty much everyone in movie theaters, but you're talking about an auditorium full of people doing this. Also, lucky for Ghostface that the studio sent the costumes and a ton of people chose to wear them for the sneak preview, because if that didn't happen, I'm not sure how the killer's plan works. He would just move on to a different plan and kill them somewhere else? What? Forgetting the actual stabbing that's going on right now, I don't think even 20-year-old me would have ever gone to a movie with this much bullshit going on during it. This is the dumbest audience ever to watch a movie not called Jackass. You would have gone. You mean you wouldn't have stayed. Nothing about the outside of this theater suggested this bullshit was going on inside. This self-induced isolation you got going is not healthy. I mean, you just lost a lot of your friends to a couple of crazy killers who you then had to murder, one of which was your boyfriend. Is everyone a dick in this movie? She's right, though. Sydney is precisely the kind of person that needs a support system. You want to just abandon people that have trauma? Because that's how you get ants. You could say what happened in that theater is a direct result of the movie itself. This teacher feels like it's a good idea to start discussing a new story that just broke about some fellow students that got murdered and turned it into some sort of philosophical debate on how film can turn people into murderers or some sort of bullshit. That's precisely the kind of conversation college film students need to be having. Hell, any kind of media course should discuss things like this in order to debunk these kinds of talking points. Otherwise, you get poor arguments that take hold in the community, like the dumb shit Anita Sarkeesian said about video games. It's like, on the one hand, we already discarded Jack Thompson for saying video games caused violence, but then Anita comes along, redresses that same argument, and all of a sudden, it's accepted. College is exactly where this debate should be had. Stab two? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. By definition alone, they're inferior films. The definition of a sequel is that it's the next chapter in a series of films. It does not define quality, as that is hard for a definition to do. I don't think he meant the literal definition, Jer. He's clearly talking figuratively. Aliens is a classic, okay? Get away from her, you bitch. I believe the line is stay away from her, you bitch. It's film class, right? A film class where no one knows that Randy is in fact wrong, and Joshua Jackson's quote was correct. Even though Randy is technically incorrect, Jamie Kennedy deserves a sin off, and I'll tell you why. Joshua Jackson actually got his line wrong. He was supposed to say, stay away from her, you bitch, and Jamie was supposed to correct him. But Josh ended up saying the correct line, and Jamie, on the fly, said the incorrect line as a form of improvisation, teasing the other actor. Wes thought this was more interesting, so this was the take that was used. T2. Mm. You've got a hard on for Cameron. And CC has a problem paying attention because Mickey was not the one who mentioned aliens. Ignoring the fact that she was most likely saying you in the plural sense, it doesn't matter. He named another Cameron film after one was already named. Besides, it's the only one named that actually surpasses the original. Terminator 2 is better than Terminator 1, but Alien is better than Aliens. Don't at me. I'm local, but I shot the bingo finals. Gail Weathers, who has a best-selling book and a hit movie made out of that book, can only get a cameraman who shot the bingo finals. You're ignoring the fact that no cameraman wants to work with Gail, considering what happened to her previous cameraman in the first Scream. They literally talk about this in this movie. So I get that there would be a press conference, but would they have that press conference on the college campus? The kids weren't murdered on the campus. This seems like a very convoluted way to get Sydney and Gail to meet up early in the movie. Remember what happened in the first scream at the high school? Dozens of reporters descended upon the school to report on what happened, including Gail. This means that Gail was going to be here whether they had a press conference or not, so it's not convoluted. I heard about what happened and I was on the next plane. Even if the story broke earlier the previous evening, how quickly could Dewey get on a flight and get there by the next morning? What? How long do you think flights are? California, where Dewey is from, to Ohio, where this college is, is a four to five hour flight, my dude. Even if he heard the story that morning, he could still be here at this time in the afternoon. 
Well, I was hoping I might get just a few words with you. After the events of the first movie, Gail actually thinks she can get away with sandbagging Sydney and not get punched or slapped. Your sinning characterization again. Gail is an asshole, only looking to further her own selfish goals. You are saying something is wrong with the movie because the character is acting how she was written. Hey. <gasps> Who enters a room like this? Characters that are unaware they're in a scary movie. Seriously, rewatch this scene with the sound off and pretend it's a Lifetime Channel movie about sisters growing apart after living in the same house or some shit. The only reason you thought this was a jump scare is because of the musical cue and the fact that you know this is a horror movie. Also, movie gives away the fact that there has to be at least two killers, since the one in the background of this scene clearly doesn't have a phone. Gives away the fact there are two killers? Bruv, who watches any movie in this series after the first one and assumes there is only one killer? And I know some genius is going to bring up Scream 3, but I have a few things to say about that. Firstly, if you're watching Scream 3, you've probably seen the first two, and in both those movies, there were multiple killers, meaning the assumption is always there are multiple killers. Second, there being only one killer in Scream 3 doesn't even make sense considering the amount of teleporting Ghostface does in that film. And third, Angelina was clearly an accomplice in that movie. Wes Craven intended for her to be one of the killers, and she's not technically listed as dead, so my prediction is that she returns in Scream 6 as the killer, neatly tying a bow around the events of Scream 3. Hello, Ted. You wish it was Ted. Uh-oh. It sounds like the guy on the other end of the line has cruel intentions for Daphne the Vampire Slayer, and a simply irresistible grudge, because he knows what she did last summer, and something-something Harvard man. Jeremy makes about seven pop culture references that aren't sins of this movie cliche. I get that Cece was just trying to run away from the killer, but how was her strategy going to pan out? Was she going to jump from the balcony? And not once when she has the chance does she close the door behind her and try to lock it. Casey didn't have time to lock any of the doors behind her, as Ghostface was on her tail pretty much the entire chase. And what a weird question to ask anyway. You're asking her to run at the mass serial killer. Ghostface cut off her escape route. She had no strategy because this is fight or flight, and she chose flight. She wasn't thinking, she was running, because taking time to think would get you killed in a situation like this. And I'll take some time to address the fucking idiot readying themselves to type, but she died anyway. A lot of you people love misunderstanding the points I make to try your hand at a gotcha. The point is that in a neutral situation, pausing to think in a fight or flight moment almost always ends poorly. Casey had two options after being cut off from an escape route, fight a clearly superior physical entity or run. She chose to run, and the only route that provided the much more favorable continue breathing for a few more minutes was running upstairs. That she died is immaterial to that point. This was pretty much Sarah Michelle Gellar's movie career in 1997. Getting stabbed by the killer. I think it even happened in Beverly Hills Family Robinson. Everything wrong with Scream 2. One of the characters gets killed. So is Ghostface trying to kill Sid here? Because based on what we find out later on in this movie, that makes zero sense. What is this, a leftover sin from the Scream 1 video? There's no reason Mickey and Baruch Assault wouldn't kill Sydney here. Their plan is not predicated on making her the final girl. What are you talking about? As well as her boyfriend, Stephen Orth. I send Phil Stevens. Maureen Evans, Maureen Prescott. That's Sydney's mother. I don't think this ever gets developed, and it turns out to be bullshit anyway. But what are the odds of this? The killer finds a couple who have the same or similar names to the first two victims of the Woodsboro murders, then kills a third person who just happened to have the same name as the third victim? It's a total red herring, but it's some incredible bullshit if it wasn't on purpose. Casey, Stephen, and Maureen are fairly common names, and I put the frequency of these names in the U.S. on the screen. An American has a 0.04% chance of being named Casey, a 0.05% chance of having the name Maureen, and a 0.4% chance of being named Stephen. A medium-sized college has around 15,000 students, so statistically speaking, there should be 8 Maureens, 6 Caseys, and 60 Stevens. Now that we have rough statistical odds... Oh my god, who the hell cares? Also, why is Gail even here? Maybe they would let Dewey in since he was a cop on the original case. But Gail is still a reporter and hasn't exactly proven herself to be trustworthy. I think it's obvious why Gail is here, most especially because she is a survivor of the Woodsboro murders and literally wrote the book on them. Besides that, this is campus security, not a police station, which it's obvious that's what you assumed. In the establishing shot, you can see a reporter leaving the interior of this building, and considering Gail is an expert, it makes sense why she has access. The director said, let's have your character start this scene carrying an apple in his mouth. It'll make him look even more like the obvious killer of this movie and an asshole. Logic that is entirely nullified by Derek also holding an apple in this shot and Hallie having one on her tray. Also, notice how Derek is eating a green apple while Mickey eats a red one. 
Yep, they're both equally assholes. Just one's a killer is all. Again, Hallie also has an apple on her tray and a red one at that. So this is not only a stupid waste of our time, it also nullifies the previous sin. What is he doing? Uh, Tom Cruise Top Gun 1986. You know what makes the film nerds in these movies so f***ing annoying? Naming the actor, the movie, and the f***ing year during a movie reference. You know what makes the fact that you consider yourself to be hyper-observant so f***ing annoying? That you miss things like, this isn't the song saying in Top Gun. That was You've Lost That Loving Feeling. Kudos to Scream 2 for making Sydney's joke prediction from the first movie come true, that Tori Spelling would play her in the movie about her. But even in the 90s, can you name one movie where Tori Spelling would have been given the lead in any major film? That's racist. Who discovers that her boyfriend's this crazy serial killer. God damn, Tori spoiling alert. That's like going to watch Half-Blood Prince on release day and being upset someone blurts out that Snape kills Dumbledore. In other words, getting mad about something 99% of everyone watching already knows. The guy's pre-med and his pity me service wound conveniently missed every major vein and artery. So you think it's Derek? Now Dewey is taking opinions from a college kid film nerd seriously? He might be the worst cop ever. Randy's literal first guess was correct, and so were his rules. Listening to Randy was the best thing they could have done. First of all, he wasn't gutted. I made that up. His throat was slashed. Why would you change that detail? Because getting gutted sounds more rad than getting the throat slashed? I need you. I cannot do this without you. Not trying to belittle a camera person's job, but would it really be that hard for Gail to find another person to fill in for Joel? Yeah, you are denigrating a cameraman's job. Firstly, they just told you why no other cameraman wanted to take the job in the first place, and rightfully so. But you clearly have no idea the difference between a random person filming something and an experienced cameraman. Trust me, the difference is apples and oranges. With all that's going on, it's totally asinine that the drama teacher would put her in a scene where she's basically repeatedly being stabbed by masked strangers. I don't know. Considering Sydney wants to be an actress, she would seem like the perfect person for this role, no? The killer's trying to finish what was started. This is a very good point that Randy is making, and by the end of the film, this is clearly the motive. Which begs the question, why the hell were the first three people killed? And how did the killers even know if anyone would figure out the first three victims were tied to the previous victims, especially since it was such a loose threat? Hilarious misunderstanding of this movie. Movie. Mickey explicitly states that he intended on getting caught and making the biggest impact since OJ. That being the case, it was Mickey's idea to recreate the Woodsboro murders in an attempt at infamy and to that end devised a ridiculous plan to kill the first three victims. Since he shares a class with Randy, he knew that at the very least, Randy would figure out the connection between the new victims and original ones. They quite literally go back and forth on movie trivia, so it was not that long a shot. Also, why don't Randy, Gale, and Dewey have police protection as well? They also survived the Woodsboro murders. They also haven't yet had an attempt on their lives and weren't the subject of those murders either. What was the killer's plan if Randy had chosen to walk with the phone in the opposite direction? Like I said earlier, these characters literally walk into their murders. He might have simply survived. Randy wasn't a target in this film. Salty Loomis states that she killed Randy because he badmouthed Billy. You have an instant message, that's how I'll just hit out to him. <laughs> Hilarious 90s computer lingo. <laughs> I'm doubling up the that f***ing laugh sin on account of you being so lazy, you literally just played the same recording of that fake laugh twice. Damn, dude, he said hit all M, not QWERTY, or whatever you just typed. Dude, I heard four button presses, and QWERTY has six strokes. She clearly typed B-N-U-S. Uh, they impounded my van. It's now an official crime scene, thanks to you. Um, because the killer opened your unlocked van and used it to kill Randy, it's Gail's fault? Fam, you literally send a scene showing Gail coerced him into staying. How do you forget things you yourself talked about? So let me get this straight. Somebody, probably Mickey, decided to edit all his stalker footage together just in case Gail and Dewey came here tonight to watch their footage? No. Mickey has been recording the murders in order to prepare his defense in court. Remember, he is a film student and plans on blaming the movies for his acts. Either Mickey or Debbie Salt just killed a trained detective, was able to basically climb in one motion on top of the car, and is able to pull off a nifty kick to another trained detective. I don't think Mickey or Debbie fit the Jackie Chan mold, but here we are. This was almost certainly Mickey, and I know the last time you did a pull-up you were in your father's nutsack, but a normal athletic male should be able to do this no problem. I'm not car, you just shoot his ass! I agree, but Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. Also, even though I agree, there was still the small possibility he misses and shoots one of the women. I just must get out of here. We're not in a cop car. Yes, it's a cop car, but the killer was able to punch his way through a window a minute ago. Why can't you guys kick the window out? Probably because Ghostface shouldn't have been able to punch through a car window in the first place without some type of ceramic that instantly shatters most glass. You ever tried kicking a car door window? <laughs> Good luck. Movies keep trying to sell us on the idea that a killer can regain consciousness and exit a car without anyone hearing or seeing anything, even though they were only 20 feet away. Trying? You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. I almost got killed. Where should I run? 
Got it. I'll go to the theater. It's brimming with cops. I mean, props. Hello? Is there someone who's at least a second year drama student who can help me? In an earlier scene, Dewey implies that he's going to stay behind looking for the killer. This is why Sid returns to the school, as Dwight is the only one she trusts. So did the frat asshats just leave Derek here, knock him unconscious, and duct tape his mouth? Yet another convenient chain of events for Ghostface. Does the killer actually have to do any of his or her own work in this movie? You said that like Derek was a target. The movie stated quite clearly that Derek would be punished for giving Sidney his Greek letters, so that's why they left him here. He dies due to coincidence, just like Randy. Surprise, Sidney. So wait a minute. Was the plan to unmask and explain all the motives to Sydney? How many times could she have died in this movie? And here we have the resolution to the earlier mistake you made in this video when you assumed the plan was to get Sydney here. Mrs. Loomis? Sydney recognizes her immediately, but yet somehow never saw her the many times she was roaming around campus. Okay. Do you notice everyone on a school campus? Wait a minute, don't answer that. Mickey was a good boy, but my god, that won't blame the movie's motive. Once again, why are we talking so much and not trying to kill Sydney like you did 30 minutes into the movie? Because that was Mickey, not Evelyn Salt. Everything's traceable back to Mickey, including the cop gun he used to kill everybody. Except for all the people that weren't killed with a gun. My dude, she said including the cop gun, as in in addition to, also, to, as well. Wait, are these like real rocks? Not stage rocks? I guess they teach method at this school. They're clearly not real. Simply waited. Come on, Jeremy. I always come back. <laughs> how many times did this motherfucker get shot? It was three times by my count. Even if he's alive, how can he shoot up like this when he has virtually no blood left? Adrenaline. Or if you're one of those weirdos that take YouTube fan theories as fact, Venom. Hello, Ted. <laughs>